We have uh, Iqbal Arshad, who's the Senior Vice President of Engineering, uh, Global Product Development at Motorola Mobility. Uh, he has successfully led uh, the development of some, some uh, wondrous products that you all know, uh, Motox, Droid, Razor, uh, and a number of others that, uh, that uh, he'll make us all aware of. He led the, uh, the uh, effort to uh, bring the original Droid to market, and all of us remember how that, that rollout uh, was, was absolutely outstanding. He has served as the uh, Vice President and General Manager of Motorola Europe, holds a Bachelor of Science uh, Electrical Engineering from the Uni University of Miami, but he's also one of ours in that he did his master's here in the Master of Engineering Management program, and he serves on that board. So thanks for coming. Great to have you here. Can you guys hear me? Thank you, Walter. And. Um, I think before we fix spreadsheets, we need to fix Windows. <laughs> <laughs> so we've got a big project for Quill. Um, it's uh, it's uh, actually today was a great drive uh, coming to the campus. I remember driving for an hour and a half or so coming from Libertyville um, to Evanston. Um, I don't know if you know, uh, Motorola just recently moved to Chicago into the Merchandise Mart. We have about over 700,000 square feet of space there. Um, and all the engineers would love to know that we have over 70,000 square feet of state-of-the-art lab space with close to 1,500 engineers right smack in, in the heart of downtown Chicago, bringing big technology to Chicago. So really, really excited about that. Um, it's, um, it's, uh, it's really uh, great to be back on this campus and, and meeting a lot of folks. Um, I've always personally uh, admired the MPD program. I think it's really great. Um, as a kid growing up, um, I used to make all sorts of electronic circuits, radios, transmitters. Um, I loved making mechanical things. I used to make a lot of radio control airplanes. Um, and then I also fell in love with the computers when they came out. Uh, if you, some of you remember the Commodores and the ZX Spectrum, and I was so passionate, and that passion led me to go to engineering school. I convinced my dad to send me to a private school. I love football also, so I went to University of Miami, and uh, by the time I got done with engineering, um, you know, I had absolutely zero exposure to product development process. Um, I learned a great deal about engineering, but zero exposure to product development, and then also completely unaware of the discipline of design itself. But luckily, uh, you know, I was hired by Motorola. As you know, that's a technology and a product-based company. And there I learned to use technology to solve really, really big problems. And I also got exposed to the entire product development process. And uh, one thing I tell you that uh, most companies today are set up to follow a process. And people are not really encouraged to come up with new ideas within a company. And um, if you take design-based thinking and framework itself, combined with great engineering and technology, that can lead to true breakthroughs, and I've seen that throughout my long career. And so it's really, really exciting uh, for me to see Northwestern bringing design, engineering, and the whole development process together. So it's, it's really exciting for me to be here. It's, I'm really honored to be here today. And uh, so the topic of my presentation is the bla black magic of, uh, of design itself. And, um, you know, if most of us oftentimes wonder how amazing things like the airline service or the subway system, the modern day uh, smartphone products or animated movies are created, I can certainly tell you that these magical things that have transformed our lives 
are not created by single organizations or teams like an industrial design team or an electrical engineering team, mechanical engineering team, software team, or a group of scientists uh, working in a silo um, or working um, on their own. And, um, you know, I think first we have to start by asking the most basic and fundamental question. And the question is really, why do we see breakthroughs once every several years? Why do only a handful of companies can create these breakthrough products and jump the curve versus doing incremental work? And I think there are two main reasons for that. Number one, there aren't too many people who have the skill set to apply system level design thinking. Number two, most corporate structures, I think, are outdated. Again, the functional teams are set up to follow a process and work in silos. So, if you, if you really think about, if you really think about uh, how system level design think uh, system level design thinking can change that i think you have to look at in multiple different scenarios so the first one if you apply the system level design thinking i think it it uh, requires you to think through number one consumer number two the business model itself design platform and the ecosystem. So it, it forces you to think through the wide variety of aspects that you need to build breakthrough products. And um, to give you some examples of that, um, you know, this is my favorite example. Uh, if you were to look at from a component level thinking, uh, this example, you know, you would say that Traditional thermostats are designed to simply adjust the temperature in a building. And uh, well, while that's true, and most of the companies who are building thermostats would just follow that objective and simply ship those products. And the product I'm showing on the right side, I'm pretty sure that most of you know about this product. It's called Nest, and uh, it's, it's a new thermostat. Uh, so if you look at system level design thinking from that lens, let's start out with the consumer. The companies who are building this product actually looked at thermostat and thought of a consumer problem as consumers just want, they just simply want to adjust the temperature in their homes. Nest completely looked at the problem differently. When they looked at the consumer problem, they thought about consumers are actually looking for comfort in their house. Consumers are looking for ease of use and consumers are actually want to save money, uh, save money or cost on energy. So that was the approach they took in building their product. And purely from a design and aesthetics, I can for sure tell you that the product that I would like to have on my wall is the object on the right side. I mean, it's a completely different approach. It's a very beautiful, simple, and elegant design. And then if you think about from a total system standpoint, Nest stepped back and looked at the system in totality. And they wanted to build an environmental management system. And what they did was they took the best of technologies. They took the latest embedded processing technology. They took the latest UI design they integrated sensors, they added connectivity. And so the integration of technology they did on this project allowed them to deliver on the consumer pain points. And lastly is the ecosystem. So if you think about it, traditional thermostats simply don't have an ecosystem. You simply go to Home Depot, you buy them, they serve a singular purpose. In case of Nest, they're working with the power companies to save you costs, they're working with installers to help you install these things. They're working with app developers, and they're also building other products for your home to build an entire ecosystem. 
So, so stepping back, if you really think about it, what Nest did, did in this case, uh, they, t they have a complete understanding of what the consumer need is, and they took technology and intelligently integrated a lot of different technologies to deliver on that promise and simply reinvented the boring thermostat. So I think this is a great example that shows that if you, if you use system-level design thinking, you can go reinvent existing products. Let me give you another example, which is a favorite example of mine. Growing up, I used to go to arcades to play games. And uh, over time, you know, I shifted to gaming console at home. Um, so, what I you know, so one of the problems I personally had that to play games, I actually had to go to the arcade. So that involved certain times, who I could go with and whatnot. But once I got there, my favorite game was shared by a bunch of other users. So that was another problem. And then I also had to spend a lot of money. And the different types of games I could play were limited by the physical machines that you had in the arcade. So it was, while it was great, there were a lot of different barriers to that whole design and system. And what Atari did in this case, they applied, again, system-level design thinking, and they brought the arcade into your living room, which was phenomenal. So simply what Atari did is they took a monolithic piece of technology, and then they decomposed it or decoupled it, and brought down the cost level to a point where it became mass market. So first thing they did was instead of having a dedicated display that you would have in, in the arcade, they integrated the gaming console with the TV that you already had, which was a big cost element. And then the second and the most amazing thing they did was simply they separated the game logic from the main console. So it would allow you to have different cartridges that you can put in the device itself. They effectively created the first content and app ecosystem. If you guys remember Atari, you could plug and play a lot of different games, and which was phenomenal. So in this example, Atari applied the system level design thinking and actually created a brand new ecosystem and platform and in turn created a brand new product category. So again, if you apply the system level design thinking, not that you can reinvent existing products, you can actually create new product categories. Let me give you another example. Um, and, uh, you know, if you think about system level design uh, thinking, another element of that whole thought process is um, the business model itself. Um, you know, first, you really have to look at the existing business model, you have to deconstruct it and then you have to come up with a better one. And Apple's iPod and iTunes is a great example. With great industrial design, great hardware technology, great UI, PC integration, fast connectivity, and a completely new way to buy, manage, and enjoy your music is how they redefine the entire music industry. I think it was a great example, and even to this date, with the same system they have, they've added, obviously over time, video, books, apps, and other ecosystem, and they have a multitude of products that ride on the same ecosystem, and Apple is massively successful. Again, thinking about the business model itself is extremely, extremely important in terms of when you're applying the system level design thinking. The next one is something that we've recently done uh, with one of our products that we launched. It's called Moto X. And in this case, uh, you know, the other dimension to think about when you're, again, thinking about system level design is how to create fundamentally different user experiences. And the user experiences can fundamentally change when you change the user interaction itself. So, you know, what you see on the, on the left side of you is a typical keyboard where you enter your numbers um, to make a call or you use your QWERTY keyboard to do a search and whatnot. Um, and the fundamental question we started out with that, how do you make 
a lot of things on your smartphone smarter. And so we started out with a simple problem that said, can we make a call? Can we do a search? Can we simply navigate without touching the phone? And it started out with that simple design question, and we used great technology insight to solve that problem. What we created is a, th is a feature called touchless control, and in that feature, we created an entire new low-power processing system to make sure that you can actually talk to your phone without even touching it or without even turning it on. That meant that a lot of things in the device needed to be turned on. So to give you an example, so if I, my phone is here and I haven't touched my phone, I can simply say, OK, Google now. And you can see that it's saying hi there. So it's responding to me. That was the first step. And then after that, we had to come up with a brand new way of doing speech processing where we had to discern somebody who's actually giving a command to the phone versus all the background noise. Well, if you're in a mall, you have a TV in the background, how would you discern the noise or different you know, input that's coming to the device? So we had to go through all sorts of signs to actually get that done. Uh, but at the end of the day, we got that done, and we simply changed our user interaction paradigm. To give you an example, um, let me just play this. OK, Google Now, navigate to the Merchandise Mart. There you go. And I can just hit the button and do it, which is phenomenal. That feature has been really great. Another example is um, we also wanted to make sure that we take the blinky LED on your phone, something as simple as that. You could see that as a simple design problem and replace it with something much, much more useful. And our research showed that people actually, on an average, take their phones out of their pocket and turn it on to 60 times a day to look for notifications and other important information. So again, we had to create another brand new processing technology and something that Chris talked about. We had a whole contextual engine actually in the device to figure out what, what would be important for you at a particular point in time and then use that contextual engine with the power of cloud computing that we have. And it's a, it's a thing called Google Now. It's a completely intelligent based system which essentially is the same thing that I showed you. And what you see here is that without even turning on the phone, we have a low power system that's always on. We designed a brand new display system and a touch system where you can constantly see if there's something important. You can go into a peak mode. You can simply swipe it and get into the app directly. So this is another example of to look at a system as a whole to solve a simple problem, but you change the whole user interaction paradigm and experience itself. So to wrap it up, uh, you know, the system level design thinking is actually the black magic of design. And it's just a holistic way of looking at design versus a particular area. The five things I talked about, essentially the consumer, uh, you know, understanding the consumer need, Number two, looking at a total system solution versus designing you know, a product itself that does a particular function. You gotta look at an end-to-end -end, uh, problem and coming up with a solution for that. Uh, the third thing I would say is it's fundamentally important if you wanna do something really groundbreaking and game-changing is also look at the business model itself and see if you can change that and then also um, look at the platform itself. If you can create a platform and you can create an ecosystem on top of the platform, and then obviously, last but not least, how do you design those things and how do you deliver experiences on those? So uh, I would say that every, for everybody in this room, I think it's a great opportunity with the kind of background and education you're getting in these programs to go build you know, truly, truly amazing products that you really, really love. Thank you.